Hello! Hi! How are you? I'm Sophie, this is Bibliosophie, and I have COVID! Bibliosophie I am just in the midst of finishing up, speaking of maybe things that are not great if you're feeling quite depressed by your body being under assault from a virus, um, I'm finishing up Heather Clark's gigantic uh, biography of Sylvia Plath, Red Comet. Uh, I have, I think, maybe 20 or so minutes left on the audiobook. The audiobook is uh, 45 hours long. I think the physical book is something like a thousand hundred and some odd pages. So it's an investment of your time, but I have really enjoyed it, if you can call it that. Uh, I definitely issue a trigger warning uh, if you don't want to read about depression um, and definitely suicidal ideation. Should be no surprise. Um, spoiler alert, she does die by suicide uh, at the end. Uh, I however found that it wasn't um, because Clark doesn't over dramatize things and keeps her very, very meticulously researched story um, very sympathetic and I think even handed. Um, the final stretch, the final days and hours to her suicide um, were not that triggering or harrowing to me, actually. Um, I found her first attempt at suicide in 1953 and then her subsequent hospitalization actually very triggering and harrowing. Uh, and so when I was at that point, um, I thought to myself, Oy -oy -oy. I may not be able to finish this book. Uh, first of all, not just because it is 45 hours long and I don't know if I'm going to get through 45 hours of this material in the three week period that I have this out from the library, but also if this is already so difficult and she survives this one, how am I going to deal with her actual suicide? But um, I found that Clark deals with it in a very sensitive and un... Um, and obviously acknowledging how sad and kind of traumatizing it is for everybody involved. But as I said, just kind of un overly dramatic. Uh, I've always been pretty wary of Sylvia Plath for, for bad reasons, for the kind of typical sexist reasons of, oh, you know, that's, that's the, the sad girl poetess who dies by suicide. This is, this is uh, the poet that sad girls like, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, learning more about her in a way that really puts into perspective that sadness uh, as being probably, you know, genetic depression, but also very much a reflection of uh, the constraints of being a mid-century American woman, um, and then subsequently an American woman in Britain. Uh, it also made me understand Plath as less of a kind of flash in the pan and more of a really, really meticulous driven worker. Um, her, her depression and anxiety as also stemming from such a, an obsession with achievement, um, which definitely resonated with me. Uh, I think that's probably what made her um, depressive period, her highly depressive period as a student in the early 50s, probably harder to read um, because <laughs> I saw uh, too many shades of myself in there probably. Um, and I've also been wary of Plath 
and her work for better reasons, in my opinion, which is especially the kind of um, appropriation of Holocaust imagery and even of kind of the Jewish experience uh, that I've read in her work. Uh, and that remains, I do think that it remains appropriation. Um, the fact that she makes her, uh, her character in um, The Bell Jar, who is essentially telling her story uh, as a 19, 20 year old, Jewish, is telling and the fact that she uses a lot of the like visceral Holocaust imagery and is sort of self-appointing herself to Jewish suffering, I, f I still find suspicious, but, excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> but um, I do have some more context to be less contemptuous and less allergic to it. Uh, it's also not quite as, um, grotesque, as I always thought, based on not knowing um, her works, honestly, very well, or really at all. Um, and so knowing her pieces better, I can sort of see them within even their own context as a lot more subtle than I once feared, and then within the context of her life as explainable, if not necessarily um, excusable, and that's not my call to make, also. Um, yeah, it was a really great book. Um, I find that Clark has a lot of sensitivity to uh, the complicated nature of the relationships in Plath's life. Um, she restores Plath to being a political figure, actually. Um, as opposed to just a slighted figure and in her bad relationship with Ted Hughes, um, there's just a lot more even-handed context than I've ever seen. So he's not just this horrifying, abusive husband who left her for another woman, left her all alone, and then um, she, she kills herself as a result of being this abandoned woman. It's it complicates her character and his um, in a very meticulous and, I think, uh, honest way. So, uh, not for everybody. Definitely a trigger warning if uh, you don't want to read over a thousand pages about somebody who does end up dying by suicide. And there's also more suicide around um, just Plath herself. Um, more than just Plath herself. Um, and not everybody wants to read a thousand pages on anybody, quite honestly. But if you're in the business of um, historical figure biographies, especially literary biographies, um, it, is, it is really worth the hype. Uh, however, that said, I did feel last night after talking to a friend that uh, maybe it'd be good for me to have kind of a corrective um, other thing that I would be reading. So I put out a call on Instagram uh, for recommendations of uh, fiction, short fiction that isn't overly thinky and uh, and kind of depressive. Uh, so many of us um, in the booktube environs and in the bookstagram environs uh, are definitely drawn to uh, the thinky woman, depressed, kind of cogitating and ruminating, uh, which I love. But I felt I should uh, get out of that maybe uh, after spending 45 hours with Sylvia Plath. Uh, and I started um, To Be Taught If Fortunate by Becky Chambers, which uh, is a short book. It's a novella, uh, sci-fi, and it's about, from what I can tell so far, about a team of uh, four astronauts in the future who are exploring a series of um, Earth-like planets, planets at least that have 
some um, life on them. And I'm only about 30 pages or so into it. Uh, so far, really enjoying the voice of it. Um, and yeah, I'll check in about how it is. Till later. And for those of you wondering about the quarantine outfits, day two is uh, cozy, loose, basically a pajama. Uh, I finished To Be Taught If Fortunate uh, last night, i.e. just over 24 hours after I started it. It's a very short book, but it's also a very fast read. It's actually not super, super plotty in some ways. Um, we're following four astronauts as they go consecutively to a series of four planets and uh, kind of the description of what they see on each planet is kind of like a mission report sent that's going to be sent back to Earth. And I don't want to tell you too much about what happens. Uh, in some ways it's a very very broad scope, I mean it's literally cosmic, uh, and then also it's actually very very intimate because it's sort of about the relationships between these four characters and especially um, the relationship to knowledge and exploration that the main character and narrator, whose name is Ariadne, um, has when in her in being an astronaut, essentially. Uh, that's actually what the title, which I found sort of funny, comes from. Um, at the after the end of the book, the uh, author puts um, part of the speech that the UN Secretary General uh, was recorded speaking on the Voyager Golden Record in 1977, I believe. Yes, um, and that's the to be taught if fortunate is a, is an excerpt from that. Um, we step out of our solar system into the universe seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon to be taught if we are fortunate. And that's very much a through line for the book. It's about curiosity. It's about learning. Um, it's not my favorite book of the year by any stretch, but it was really enjoyable. Uh, it suffers from the things that I would expect it to, and partially it's just kind of my fault more than its fault. Um, it has too much dialogue for my taste, and especially the kind of like uh, filmic uh, filler dialogue uh, of, oh, I can do this, no, I can do it. Well, if you insist, yeah, no problem, the kind of like work-a-day dialogue that we have in our daily lives but I just don't really need to read about. Uh, the writing style is quite good if not transcendent. Sometimes I feel like Chambers um, kind of overwrites or just um, gives too many times the same thing um, in a description. For instance, she'll give the metaphor more than once uh, or more than one metaphor to describe something, I should say. And so it gets a little bit redundant in my mind. Um, and then my maybe third qualm, if we can call, uh, call it that, is I think she over explains some of the science. Uh, and that's again, kind of my fault more than its fault. I understand why she would want to explain the science. Um, I don't feel the need to be told some of these things. Uh, some of these things I know and remember, um, but that's not necessarily the case. So I don't need Nidarian uh, defined, you might. And so that's, I realize, very much a me problem. Um, yeah, if you're looking for something really absorbing but also not kind of stressful, and uh, that's quite short. I think it's a really good book to pick up. Uh, and it's also nice that it's such a short, standalone piece of science fiction. Uh, I had never heard of Becky Chambers because I'm not really a sci-fi person, but she has obviously written quite a lot of uh, books that are part of a longer collection. Um, so it's nice to actually just have something that stands on its own. Why not? Um, I'm going to maybe pick up another book and write a, and 
speak about it. Who can say? I have coursework to do. I put on lipstick today, so I'm feeling quite good about that. Also, feeling quite good about this robe, this onesie, because always love a onesie. And of course, these slippers. Going to work on a bit of music, looking out at the sunset, which is really nice. excitedly uh, thanks to a couple people first of all yesterday my mother sent me this uh, biography of the composer Chopin by Alan Walker uh, she obviously got very into his lectures on uh, Chopin and decided that I would be interested so very random but also very much appreciated merci maman and my friend Kara today uh, deposited a little care package with bagels, my current lifeblood essentially, and two books, uh, Enter the Aardvark by Jessica Anthony, which I know nothing about, but basically a Republican congressman is sent a taxidermied aardvark and some stuff ensues, so she's a slim boy. Uh, I think I'm gonna try to read it next. I know nothing about it, and I'm curious. And then very much I know nothing about, and it's very much out of my comfort zone, a graphic novel. It's blurbed by Autostraddle, so I'm intrigued. Uh, and it's uh, conceived, written by uh, Carly Usden, uh, called Heavy Vinyl. I have never really been a... Um, bande dessinée graphic novel person, so I don't know if it'll gel for me, but I am curious. Oh, and also, wore lipstick for class again today, wore a dress, and sparkly tights. I finished uh, Enter the Aardvark last night, which means it, just, it took me just over a day to finish this one as well. Definitely recommend it. Weird, fast read. And actually, if you want to go into it with as little knowledge as I did, I propose you stop this video now, and I'll see you in the next one. If you want a tiny bit more information, here goes. We're following two different storylines connected by this aardvark. One is in 1875 England, and one is in current day United States in Washington, D.C. In 1875, we're following uh, a taxidermist who stuffs the aardvark, and in the present day, we're following a uh, congressman, a Republican, young, hotshot, very conservative, very vapid congressman who, early on in the book, receives this same uh, stuffed aardvark uh, from his secret gay lover. And a series of unfortunate events, essentially, uh, ensue. So the 1875 passages are in the third person, but the current day ones are actually in the second person, vaguely omniscient, but also very much in the headspace of this vapid congressman. And it's very annoying, frustrating, and delicious all at once. My one caveat is you have to be willing to follow the inner workings of this pretty reprehensible, vapid dude. And actually also our taxidermist is not cool either. Uh, I think the congressman is worse, but 
neither is a fun, cool dude, quite honestly. What's really delicious and a good touch is that this congressman is really, really obsessed with Ronald Reagan, of course, and kind of the aspirational conservative lifestyle. So he wants to dress the part. He wants to kind of cosplay as Ronald Reagan and is constantly hunting down uh, cufflinks to look like Ronald Reagan. This shirt, this hat, these boots, but also home decor. And Anthony gives the price tag to all of these um, objects that populate and create this guy's life really uh it which is a great touch also you get the kind of very shallow hypocritical and very cynical unfeeling uh inner workings in the uh narration of um especially the congressman just how ignorant he is and just how uncurious he is about life and people that are not in his shoes. Uh, to illustrate this, I liked this little passage. Mild spoiler alert, we do find out, I don't know, somewhere like here maybe in the book, a few dozen pages in, that Greg Tampico, um, our, one of our protagonists, gay lover, uh, is dead, in fact. Uh, so, the sadness you feel over losing him begins rising, like, you just did not expect to feel this way, but you do. And it's what writers of first centuries have called melancholia, but because you don't read books, your language is limited. You cannot articulate the feeling you feel beyond the word sad. You are like all at once very sad that Tempe goes dead. Very sad that you will never lie with him on the large zebra skin in the walk up on King Street. So you get a good sense for this kind of just like completely unself-aware, I think that's the best word, uh, inner workings of this guy. It's been a good reading week, I have to say. Uh, my two short kind of uh, cure novels have served me very, very well. Uh, the Sylvia Plath biography, which seems now an eternity away, also served me very well. I feel basically quite uh, giri cured. Uh, I'm completely fine again. I'll be uh, quarantining for a little bit longer, uh, but it's been as kind of painless an experience, I think, as I could possibly have asked for. So I'll see you in the next one, healthier uh, probably, and ideally more able to go out into the outside world. Cheers.